Just we'll just do one last check. Okay, I just want to make sure everything is showing up fine. Okay, um, thanks everyone for coming. There, I, I know there's no time limit on this. I really hope not to keep you here all night. Uh, it's way past my bedtime. So what I'm doing today is I want to present on two completely related subjects. They're, they're not at all related, but as an academic, of course, we're always trying to merge things together, which really don't belong together. Uh, and I get a lot of practice with that. So this is sort of a two-parter. The first is about scaling undergraduate research experiences and why I think that's a really good idea and how you can go about doing that. And the second part is, yeah, it's about COVID-19 drug development, but it's not really about COVID-19 drug development. It's more about um, trying to integrate interdisciplinary work into a single group and the benefits of doing that, as well as collaborating outside of um, a research group to do things. And the benefits to training and the benefits to doing science. So I need to select the right window. There we go. So. My group is at the University of Windsor. We are a small local school, uh, regional school, uh, catchment area of about a million people in southwestern Ontario. Uh, we are literally across the river from Detroit. This is the Ambassador Bridge, which is the busiest border crossing between Canada and the United States. Uh, the University of Windsor is located in the shadow of the Ambassador Bridge. My building is just off to the right here. I can, we see it outside the windows from our lab, so we can see how slowly traffic is moving at any moment. And what my group does and what I wanted to do is I'm a, um, I'm a synthetic organic chemist and a molecular biologist by training. And mostly on the synthetic organic chemistry side. And what I, um, what I realized pretty early on is that if I really wanted to do pure synthetic organic chemistry, I could do that and I could do it with absolutely no resources or funds or support. So I pivoted to doing a lot more medicinal chemistry. And I, this, the secret is I'm doing synthetic organic chemistry and it's medicinal chemistry, but it's the same thing. And what I really want to be doing is I'm interested in this cycle that more than any particular project or particular um, challenge or particular subject, I'm interested in this. I want to design things. Uh, my group has a lot of computational chemists and we're working on all atomic and uh, coarse grain models, depending on what the system is, to try and design new drug molecules for well-validated protein targets. So we know the protein is important for disease. Um, it's been either looked at 40, 50 years ago and not much since, or it's newly discovered. Not really interested in going into something where it's busy with a lot of other people, really smart people looking at it. We want to do something that's a little bit off the beaten path. And I'm really interested in unnatural amino acids and unnatural sugars. Uh, so we can target things that are sort of considered untargetable sometimes. Then we go into our lab and we make these uh, using synthetic chemistry, peptide synthesis, peptide engineering, whatever the case may be, whatever tools we need. Again, my training is as a synthetic chemist, as a carbohydrate chemist. So this is this is my this is my home is making, although it's kind of in a lot of ways the least important component of all this circle. And then we go into the lab and we test these things. And so we design new bioassays, we do protein production. Because a lot of our computational chemistry is predicting protein ligand binding, we need to make the isolated protein so that we can use biophysics techniques to actually measure the binding so we can see if that our design principle was at all reasonable um, or meaningful or if it was just we're, we're missing something really important and we need to rethink the basic biology uh, of the system which can then inform collaborators who work on basic biology so i'm really interested in this cycle because when it works it's, it's beautiful it's just this nice iterative workflow which keeps everybody busy for a long period of time. So I started my lab in 2016. Uh, I'm an assistant professor still. And, you know, when I, when I, when I started, I got handed this book. Uh, it's called Making the Right Moves, A Practical Guide to Scientific Management for Postdocs and New Faculty. Actually, my wife gave me this book. Um, she was an assistant professor of practice at Wayne State, which is in Detroit, right across the river. And she got provided with these resources and then she handed them to me because she was mostly supervising students at that time. Uh, she's now relocated to our university at Windsor. And 
one of the statements in here is talking about staffing your lab because it's really, really important if you have a ginormous startup, which I didn't have, about how you go about staffing your lab. So consider bringing a graduate student on board once your lab is running and you have time to invest in training. Great. Working with your technician. Um, again, we don't have money for technicians in our startup. And graduate student can provide you with additional intellectual stimulation and so forth. And then hire your postdoc again with the money that we didn't have for your main project. Now, the second paragraph is where I want to talk. You may want to be cautious about taking on undergraduates because of the large time investment needed to make them fully a part of the lab. If you decide to take on an undergraduate, consider limiting the initial assignment to one semester. Okay. Um, a lot of really good advice in this book. I agree with a lot of it. This, I didn't follow. So in 2016, when I started my group, um, this was us, beautiful fall day, a couple of two graduate students, uh, three graduate students, single undergrad, according to the book rules, and a postdoc who was married to a graduate student. And so it was, it was a good sort of deal. In spring, we'd added a few more people and most of them were undergrads, but still, you know, it was a um, mid-sized group. At, this was actually a quite large group for our institution. And then today, we're, we're a really large group. Um, we're about 14 postdocs, 14 grad students, and approximately 30 undergrads. We're a little bit below our normal complement because of COVID. A couple of texts. These are the people who give us the money, and these are the people who do all the work I'm really going to be talking about today when I'm talking about the science. Uh, I managed to actually update our photo uh, last week because we had a group party in a park. It's a really nice park. And a bunch of the people showed up. So in a lot of cases, this was a lot of us meeting each other for the first time. I got to meet some of my students for the first time because of COVID. We're trying to work as remotely as possible. So the computational chemists are working from home. So I want to go back to that statement from that initial paper. And I think what the problem there is that as academics, we infantilize undergrads. And I think one of the issues that comes up is because a lot of our interactions with undergraduate students is with respect to our teaching role. And in our teaching role, we can sometimes get the opinion that the undergraduate students are maybe not as mature, maybe not taking the material as seriously. We're, we're having conversations about grading. Um, there, there's very much a power dynamic that exists in the teaching classroom and especially in any kind of lecture course. And so when you get an undergraduate student in your research lab, it's, I think, very natural to infantilize them. And I've had this conversation with a lot of colleagues, and it almost seems like there's this thought that something magical happens at the end of four years when you hand that student a degree. And, you know, the next day, suddenly they are a postgraduate, and now they can take on all sorts of responsibility and do all sorts of things, which would have been unthinkable of them as undergraduates. That's clearly insane. So I think the underlying philosophy of what I use is that undergraduate researchers are just scientists who are concurrently pursuing an undergraduate degree. My graduate researchers are scientists who are per concurrently pursuing doctorates or mas terminal master's degrees. Uh, we do a lot of terminal master's degrees in Canada. And my postdoctoral fellows are researchers who happen to be doing a job, waiting for somebody to die so they can take their job. And I'm just a researcher who happens to be spending all of his time in administration and meetings. Because when we think of the undergraduates, this is sometimes the vision that I get from some of my colleagues who are saying, what, what do you mean you have an undergraduate doing this, this, or this other thing? Um, you can't trust them with anything. Whereas, you know, students, people of that age that, you know, let, let's, let's be broad here, somewhere between 17 and 22, um, they are often managers and leaders in business. They're starting their own companies. They are um, managing people. They're handling money. They're doing all these different types of work out there. But suddenly, if they're in the classroom, if they're in the university setting, we knock them back a whole lot. That seems to be wasting a lot of potential, and it seems to be um, wasting a lot of potential for responsibility. So this comes down into, I think, a second train of thinking of what we need to think about as educators. So I am a university professor. 
that means that I teach and I do research. If I just wanted to do research, I wouldn't be a university professor. If I just wanted to teach, I wouldn't be working at a research university. So I want to do both. But teaching is very, very broad. And I will say that I do get a lot more excited about one-on-one -on -one interactions with students and doing that kind of training. So when we think about what is the biggest impact we can have as scientists, educators, so coming from a medicinal chemistry background, of course, uh, we're all going to cure cancer or HIV or COVID-19 or whatever current disease that we're currently putting our really great idea on. Um, is the point of my career to win a lot of prizes? No, not really. Publish more, better papers so we can win more money, so we can publish more, better papers. Uh, that's definitely part of it. I think there's a treadmill here. Um, do need to play the game. But this is what gets me up in the morning, and this is what I get really excited about, and this is why I'm doing this, is because we get to train the next generation. I like, I love working with students, um, and I love seeing light bulbs go on with things. And I love thinking about problems with students with all the frustrations that does involve because you are working with people who are learning stuff instead of people who are necessarily already experts in the field, which hurts productivity, but I, this is what's better. And I think this is what the goal is. We want to be training our students to be better than us. I want every single one of my trainees to be in a better place in their career and in their training than I was at the same stage of their career. So when does training end? I, I don't think it ever ends. I'm still learning all the time. I still go to my more senior colleagues and ask them for feedback on things. Um, I still really embrace the idea that I have absolutely no idea what I'm doing. Uh, so when does training start? And if let, let's focus this on and let, let's, let's give it a specific definition of what I mean by training. Let's say research training. When does research training start? Well, when you step foot in a research lab, okay, yeah, it makes some sense. Maybe you do a little bit beforehand. Uh, yeah, you might need some fundamental knowledge. But there's not a lot of reasons why that research training needs to start in fourth year honors theses or why it needs to start in first year graduate school. Why don't we start it in first year undergraduate? So what I'm going to talk about today is something I'm calling, I'm calling vertical peer mentoring. I don't think this is a new phrase. I also really don't think this is a new idea. This is something I'm sure a lot of you are already familiar with and are using. But it really comes down to the insight of this graph, because occasionally graphs are useful. So let's say that you spend two hours a week on each of your undergraduate researchers. That's not unreasonable. Uh, so, but if you're doing that quickly, this becomes completely insurmountable, right? Once uh, as a linear growth, uh, you have 12 undergraduates, you're spending 24 hours of your week. And of course, I only work 37.5 hours a week, wink, wink. And so that's well over half my working week. That's just not sustainable. But if we can, if we can somehow figure out a way to do this on a team based route, uh, we can really, really scale this process without actually taking too much faculty hours. And I would actually say that this graph is exaggerating the number of hours needed for the number of people when it's dedicated directly to this. And somebody's going, well, why aren't you spending more time with your students? Like, I completely understand that idea. And I'm going to argue that there's an important thing to be spending specific amounts of time and on specific issues. But there are some things that other people benefit more from spending that time with the students than the professor does. So peer mentoring is defined as providing individuals who have suffered from a specific life experience the chance to learn from those who have recovered or rehabilitated following such an experience. This is actually the definition of dictionary and I freaking love it. So like undergraduate research or university or college. Now this works really well for Alcoholics Anonymous it works really, really well for adjusting to life in college, but you don't want precise peers to be mentoring research. What we want to be doing is something a little bit more hierarchical, and that's because you don't want the blind leading the blind. You want the semi-blind leading the blind, being oversight by the slightly less than semi-blind, being overseen by the visually slightly impaired, and then by the, the visually normal. So what we want to be doing here is 
that was ableist, I apologize. What we want to be doing here is we want to be scaffolding the system. And so that's what my vertical peer mentoring system is. So peers means other trainees, but not peers, not one-on-one -on -one per se. This is often done by team. The basic idea is that senior members mentor more junior members who mentor more junior members. Again, nothing new there. Everybody does it. But we're just taking it to a real extreme. What the main point of this is, what we want to do is we want to keep the mentoring load light for any given individual. So I'm involved in all sorts of administrative roles in university and in working between my department and other kind of administrative bodies like health and safety. And one of the main focuses is, can we limit administrative bloat and administrative overhead and sort of the red tape on things? And so that's something that I'm always thinking about. How can we give the best experience, safest experience, best learning experience, most productive experience without constraining it in too much red tape? And so what we also want to do is I don't want to dump way too much mentoring load on any one given individual because then I'll have a revolution on my hands. So what I'm going to talk about is also going to provide meaningful supervision, leadership training for all mentees over their training cycle. So the main idea is that don't infantilize the undergrad. Uh, more senior undergrads can mentor more junior undergrads uh, in specific areas. And if you can make use of that, suddenly you have a pyramid scheme that works where everybody is supporting the research and everybody's getting trained down and the whole thing just kind of flows. And unlike a normal pyramid scheme, it is sustainable. So I would say that this is um, a standard hierarchy. Uh, responsibility and scientific input goes up from, you know, any new person in the lab is reporting to their direct report, who's reporting to their more direct mentor leader, who's then reporting up to me. And then the training goes down, as do the shit jobs. So what you can have here is when you're thinking about hierarchy, this may be what's jumping to your mind. This exists, we're aware of it, and we use it. Uh, and I think this is basically our structure. But this is more on training. I think what we also need to be also always thinking about is, again, embracing the idea that that hierarchy is meant to provide some structure, but it is also really meant to be broken. And so my objective is full scientific engagement because ideas go everywhere. Um, we, I have second year undergraduate students leading projects who are directing graduate students and postdocs to support that project. So the second year undergrads in charge. Um, they are the really exceptional second year undergrads. But the idea is that everybody in that room knows something that I don't know and that other people in that room don't know. And what you want to make sure you're doing for maximum productivity and maximum wasting of time and effort when we know something is stupid, somebody could point out it's stupid, is you want to make sure everybody feels comfortable raising their voice. And if you stick to that hierarchy too tightly, of course, that junior most person is never going to feel comfortable challenging me at the top. There's three layers in between. That's insane. So it's really important to make sure that you're, you're, you skip over that hierarchy on a regular basis and that you really encourage everybody to shout out their ideas um, in all the meetings. So sometimes the meetings are, do have value. So my general idea is that I want freshmen. I want first year students. And so this comes out of the idea that it takes me the same amount of time, again, thinking about experimental chemistry, experimental biology, molecular biology, biochemistry, and computational chemistry. If I get a first year student or a fourth year student who has never done research before in their life coming into my lab, it takes me the same amount of time to train them in the technical skills involved in doing any of those three things. Yes, the fourth year student knows more theoretical background, but they're equally useless at actually doing things in the lab. They've got some teaching lab stuff. Um, at best, that's 36 hours a term. And I, most of them have forgotten everything they learned in that previous 36 hours by the next term. And in that 36 hours, they normally do everything once. The, you, don't, you don't secure skills by pipetting a bunch of stuff once, loading gels once, running a Western blot once, running a column once, running a distillation once. You don't, you don't, you don't really learn anything. And so 
we don't see much benefit in getting a fourth year student versus a first year student. But there's a big cost to getting a fourth year student versus a first year student, because if you get a fourth year student, you spend four months training them. Well, OK, they spend two months before they or a month or so before they really realize what's involved. So that's October. You spend four months training them, really. So that's like October to February. They get maybe a couple months of productive work in desperately in February and March. And then they're writing their thesis in April and they're gone to their next thing. So you just took one of your people, um, you gave them a student, and they just spent a large amount of a year training somebody up who they then lose. That's costing them hours. Grad students aren't really fighting over bringing in fresh fourth year students. Like they're coming in, everyone kind of avoids eye contact when you try and assign them. So let's think about a different model for that. So if we bring in a first year student and we do that same four months training, because it takes about the same amount of time to train, train that technical skill, then we got three and a half years of them doing productive work and they're getting better and better and better. And what's even better is that one of the best ways to learn a skill and to cement a skill is to teach it to somebody else. So we're often using our second year students to teach the first year students the technical stuff and overseeing their technical training. That then frees up the graduate student to not need to oversee, you know, how to run a column. They have taught this, they check in, they make sure it's all going right, but they don't need to actually step through these, these steps taking hours and hours and hours out of their time to train somebody on this because they've got somebody else who can train that person on it. And that other person is going to gain benefit from doing that training because they're going to get questions from a person being trained that they've never thought about. And they're going to ask those up and suddenly it's a learning experience. But the big thing is it's a much better return on investment. I get three and a half years of productive research uh, from the student for four months of training. So initially I used to like actually get involved in high school recruitment stuff to actually make these connections. But this, this has become really popular. So we actually now have students applying, specifically applying to our university from across the province of Ontario. Ontario is about 14 million people because they've heard about this and they want to actually come work in our group because we're, you know, we're getting a little bit famous for being a place that as a first year student, you can walk in a couple months into your degree and start really working on, I, I think of it as cutting edge science. It's good enough science. It's new science, meaningful. So this is an old slide. I really hope it's out of date. I really hope people can point me in some new ones so I can add some stuff to this slide. But what I'm really interested in is what, what other systems are trying to do this training from first year, doing research from first year, getting involved right at the start. So UT Austin has a pretty good program, but they, they tend to scale it to the point where it's become a bit more of a, almost like a teaching lab where the students are all kind of working on the similar kind of thing and working through a protocol. Instead of here, you're dumped into a research lab, you learn some skills, you get a problem, no one's ever done anything like this, go into the literature, it's not like what anyone else is doing in a group, other people can help you with it, but you're going to have to learn how to do research. That's a very different system from, hey, do this thing in parallel, which other people have done previously. Um, there is a really good program at uh, University of Missouri uh, for freshman research in plant science, but that was when I last looked, it was restricted to 10 positions. Um, we have about 10 positions a year in our group for first year students. Uh, North Carolina a and has a mathematics learning community, which is capped at 30 students, and it's focused on tutoring and coursework with potential for research. And GeoCure at Texas A&M uh, is really focused on geology, which is great. I'm focused on chemistry. That's fine. Uh, it fo it's focused on field work. Um, but this is more, because it's field work, it's more a burst of effort. Like you're going out there for two weeks, you're doing all this stuff and then you're back and, you know, the rest of the year isn't as active necessarily on research. Whereas we're trying to keep it continuous throughout the year. We try and get sort of a 10 to 15 hour commitment uh, from incoming uh, researchers into the group. So, so the question I always get is what impact has this on had on your research? Because you're training all these people, you have all these undergrads. I, I see how this can go really, really wrong. So my lab started in 2016. Uh, sure is what I called this for a while. I've renamed it, but Science Undergraduate Research Experiences. Sure, might as well. 
it what what it really allowed me to do is enter new fields and pursue peripheral projects for publication. So there might be things that, you know, us scientists, this always happens. You do an experiment, you get a result, and you go, that's weird. But you've been funded to do X, and grad students and postdocs are expensive. And so you're like, okay, that, that's really cool. You know what? We'll come back to that someday. You know you're lying. But you're... It kind of niggles maybe for a bit and then you forget about it. This allows us to actually follow those things up. So we've actually had a bunch of papers published and a whole bunch of stuff where we're actually finding really cool results because of one throwaway thing that was just like, it's 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 all for our main mission path. I don't have the resources to chase that down. You've got a thesis to do, grad student. So we're going to have to abandon that. But now, you know, we have undergraduate students that we can say, hey, we got somebody we can throw on that project. The other big thing is that um, we can accelerate a project. So we have a couple of uh, objectives that we're way behind on because of COVID. And I'm able to throw a whole bunch of people at that because I have a bunch of trained synthetic chemists who we can suddenly flexibly move around the group and send, say, okay, you're going to take over these kinds of things. I need you to generate this. And so we have this flexible pool of man hours and hands that can really help. Um, so this act, this is an old number. It's actually higher than this now. So we're working on about 50, now it's about 65 or so projects with an undergraduate research component. Um, over 20 of them would not be active without undergraduate researchers. So they just would be dead. There's about 20 that are being led by undergraduate students. So we've also led to over 10 external international collaborations to date, which have really come from the work that these undergraduate students have done. It's really opened up some opportunities. So we've been busy, like it, training is busy, but we've been productive with that. It hasn't really slowed us down. So a lot of grants, a lot of papers, uh, and I'm doing like a full teaching load, developing courses, managing all of this, this mess. So it's, it's not as much of a drag on your time as a faculty member as you would think it would be. And I would, I would never go back. This is actually saving me time. So, um, we had this cool thing where I got like caricatures made up of all of my guys. So Iraj was my first graduate student. Uh, and he's the one who really got this whole thing rolling and bought in early when it was, uh, it was a bad deal because he had to do all this training up front. And there was no one to help him with it. So the, the challenges are what you expect. Money is always a challenge because money is always a challenge. Uh, and the initial training challenge takes time. It takes a lot of graduate student time to train up that first generation of students. And again, we scaffolded. We started small, two or three in our first year, added a few more, added a few more, added a few more. But it is exponential growth. So a vertical structure is not implementable from day one because you don't have those more senior trained undergraduate students to take over the training of the new guys. Attrition of students is a problem. Um, but it's also a good thing in that we, a lot of students who start doing this, these are really eager students, especially in first year. They have no idea what research is. They have no idea what they want to do. So what we really don't want to do is we don't want to have students coming into our group who are unhappy in our group and who feel trapped and stuck. Cause they're like, hey, this guy gave me an opportunity. I, I, I can't piss off this professor. So I'm going to keep doing this even though I'm really unhappy doing it. So what we've been is actually sort of a six week probationary period right at the beginning. And it's more that I, I frame it to the students as, okay, we're going to see how you're doing, but it's really more that we actually have a formal process that six weeks into the process, we sit down, me, their direct, their graduate or postdoctoral mentor and the undergraduate student. And we sort of say, so how's this going? Do you actually like it here? Because if you're not enjoying this and you're not having a good time, um, can I help you get into a different lab where you are going to have a good time? Because maybe, chemistry or biochemistry or whatever they happen to be doing just isn't what you thought it was or maybe this whole research thing isn't what you thought it was and this really isn't what you want to be doing and that's great too now you've learned something um since we've implemented that probationary period we tend to lose maybe 10 percent of our students there which is great because we were always losing about 10 percent of our students we we're just losing them much later on and so they were unhappy for longer periods of time good to stop that early and uh, fix it. But, you know, we still train people and, and lose them. Thank you very much, but I really want to try this other lab. And of course, we always happily smile at them and say, yes, of course, we'll happily support you with whatever you want to do. And secretly we're crushed that anyone would want to work with anyone else other than me. But 
It's okay. We'll get over it. Um, finding students willing to make uh, the meaningful commitment. Because again, because we're doing research, I do ask that the students make a 10 to 15 hour commitment per week during normal weeks, not during midterms, not during finals, blah, blah. You know what? Stuff comes up, whatever. But on average, you're kind of putting in about 10 plus hours a week. And the reason we have that limit is because what we find is that for the average student, if they're doing a lot less than that, they start getting frustrated. They start not seeing that they're making progress. And then they get unhappy. And then they don't want to come in. And then they get more frustrated. And it's just this downward spiral of viciousness and um, bad things. If they're, again, everyone is different. So some of them get by with less, some need a bit more, and 10 doesn't seem to be enough, but it really is different, and we do it case by case. But for the ones who are putting in that more time, they're often building their social connections in the lab. Um, talk about that in a moment. They're also really getting a lot more out of it. They're enjoying themselves. They're learning things. It's, it's working. Uh, space is always a struggle, and this is what I always get told. It's like, how... How do you manage to find space for having 30 additional researchers in your lab? Because as we all know, space is at a premium. Space is always at a premium. I don't think there's anywhere that that's not true. Come to that in a moment later. And money deserves to be on any list twice. That's not a challenge. So what are the advantages to the undergraduate students? Well, you know, as faculty members, we think, hey, we're giving you guys a research experience. It's wonderful. Be thankful. Um, yeah, I yeah, it, it it seems to be an advantage. A lot of them do get bit by the research bug. You know, we see complete career changes. I had a student who was in communications want to come work with us on something. Um, it was actually going to be some SciComm stuff, and then she got interested in the lab, and then suddenly she was switching from communications to organic chemistry, and now she's like going to be graduating from an organic chemistry degree. So you know, these things happen. It's kind of cool. Uh, you get a lot of students, you, I always feel of them converting them from the dark side. They were going to go to med school or dental school, and now they're going to go to grad school. I don't think I actually did them any favors that way. But the idea that a lot of them didn't know that this opportunity was open to them, that they could do research as a career. Um, under, you know, most undergraduate students go into science not to write multiple choice tests. I think a lot of them think about science being cool. And so research is doing science, and so it's cool. This one is something I always underestimate. Uh, it allows them to work directly with graduate students and faculty. Uh, so they're making suddenly connections. They're making networks. They're making friends. They're seeing how science is done and how we think about science, how we think about problems. And it's not a teaching thing because we're doing the science together. And I don't have undergraduate projects. I don't have projects where I say, you know what? Um, I don't really care about this. Let's have put an undergraduate student on it. We don't do anything that we're not going to publish, and we don't try and start anything that we don't think is going to be important. And so all of our projects are, I, I think they're important. They're probably not. So I am invested in what the undergraduate student is doing. The graduate student is invested in what the undergraduate student is doing. So we're all talking about research and the research strategies and research ideas. And so they're really seeing how we're thinking when we're solving problems that we don't know the answers to. It also really integrates students into the community. This has been really important during COVID-19, even more so, even if the, all of them have been working virtually, they have been completely on Zoom windows for all of their classes. They haven't actually met anybody. And now suddenly they're interacting, again, through Zoom windows, but with graduate students and postdocs on trying to solve problems in computational chemistry mostly is what we've been really increasing on during the pandemic. So suddenly they're being integrated into our university community. Uh, so this. We haven't had any of our students ever leave the university, which um, during undergrad, they do graduate and leave. But I, I think, so retention seems to be good. Um, we have to collect the numbers on that. So I, I'm speculating at this point. I, I have a feeling the students who choose to do this are more engaged and are probably less likely to leave anyways. But they, we do get them very, very integrated, which is wonderful. This is something I just didn't even think about. Uh, if they gain this support network, of more senior undergraduate students. So I don't know how many people in the audience are undergraduate students. Uh, I don't know how many are graduate students. I don't know how many are professors. But if you think back to undergraduates, if you're not an undergraduate, your peer group were probably your classmates in your cohort. 
you probably didn't have a lot of connections in first year with second, third, and fourth year undergraduate students. And suddenly all these students do. They're working alongside them in a the lab. They're going out with them in the evenings. They're friends with them. This is, this is their part of their social network. That has been a ridiculously huge benefit because suddenly you have these people who are more senior than you who have gone through these precise experiences or are recovering from them and they're able to give this precise advice. This has been huge. And it's actually also really worked well because these, a lot of these students are really, really feel engaged with the group. So we've had graduates who graduated way back at the very beginning or in the second year I was operating this, uh, who are now in medical school or doing something else who come back and, you know, give advice and writing letters and discussing things with the uh, more junior undergraduate students to support them moving in. They've never met each other. They've never overlapped, but because they were in the same group and they might share some middle person who overlapped with both of them, suddenly there's a, this network for formation. So we're building professional networks early. But I can write a lot better letters for undergrad students. My letter's like three, four pages long, talking about how these guys have solved problems. Um, they're, they're really good letters. And, you know, these are really engaged students. They love to learn. We are giving them an opportunity to learn. I think it's fun. I think most of them think it's fun. But we all know this. We all know it's good for undergraduate students. Um, what I want to really focus on here is, uh, I am going to move faster because I know we started a little bit slow, but still, I'm taking too long. Um, tell, don't show. We, sorry, we want to, we want to show, don't tell. And currently our, our undergraduate system has moved away from this, you know, undergraduate students working with a professor in a lab, I think that's the professor, uh, doing research work because they weren't teaching labs, you did the research stuff, um, to, and I've deleted the slide, to, um, you know, huge lecture classrooms where suddenly, you know, you are literally a number because there are 1,500 of you in there. And it's great that, you know, our undergraduate population are not entirely white men wearing suits anymore. It's not so great that by democratizing education, we have shifted away from direct interaction with research. Advantage to graduate students, this does increase student productivity. Suddenly, my grad students have teams. So they're able to spend a lot more time thinking about data, analyzing data, than just mindlessly running reactions to try and desperately generate data for the next meeting. That's humongously beneficial. Graduate students should be becoming independent scientists. If all they're doing is doing the technical work and not really having enough time to think about it because they have to generate more data, we're not doing them any favors. Suddenly, my students have some time to think. It allows us for the investigation of high-risk ideas. As I said, stuff that we wouldn't follow up, suddenly we can follow up. More papers to the grad students, makes for happy grad students, and better chance of scholarships and fellowships because more papers. Plus, they also have this actually documented mentorship, teaching, leadership kind of experience. And we can actually say, this is who they trained. We write it up. Uh, we keep track. This is the stuff that they trained them in. Here are the results of the papers that got published from this. Here's where those people ended up. This person is a good mentor. Most importantly, it prepares them for jobs outside of academia. Uh, in the chemical industry, especially the pharmaceutical industry, the work is done in teams. If you get a PhD, you're hopefully going to be eventually, if not early on, a team leader. You are going to need to manage people. Managing teams, especially multi-level teams in grad school, is a great benefit to moving into that role. It also gives us a lot of opportunities to connect with industry um, because our undergrads are working in internships. Um, they get jobs in industry. They, can, they bring their industrial partners back to the group to talk with us. So, and we suddenly can do more because we have more people to do things. Um, if you're thinking about the cost, the cost of a laboratory course uh, is about, this is all Canadian dollars, I know. Um, it's close enough. Multiply, divided by about 0.8 or multiply by 0.8 to get US dollars. So cost of a laboratory course up here, it costs us about 1400 bucks per person as an institution. Cost of a student doing undergraduate research is about $500 to $1,000 per term for 10 hours a week for 14 weeks. So this is cheaper than that. I haven't yet talked the university into giving me money for it. Uh, that's not completely true. They have provided some support, but it's 
it's not been a full amount. But suddenly now we're able to provide more diverse training, but you're covering a lot of the same material that a lab course was doing, and you're getting this experiential learning because they're actually learning how to solve problems instead of just follow a recipe. You're really cementing learning. Advantage to me, uh, everything. I wouldn't do this if it didn't benefit me. I'm a self selfish narcissist like all academics. So it improves my research productivity. Uh, I would train undergraduates anyways for fourth year projects. Why not do it earlier? It's about the same amount of work. It's actually less work because now, as I said, we have the scaffold system. More students means more papers. Um, undergraduates have no salary component. A lot of our students are taking this. We have we've devised courses now that the students can take, which is the experiential learning. So they're doing it for credit. We have some really good scholarships at the University of Windsor, which support undergraduate research uh, and depending on the individual and their family circumstances, um, we can find some funds from research funds to pay small stipends to the undergraduate students. But a lot of them are volunteering as well. It, this increases the size of my industrial network. As I said, these guys get jobs. Suddenly they have a good feeling about their experience here. Suddenly I've got some friends. This is good. And we have this term in Canada, HQP, highly qualified personnel. I get judged on it by all my granting agencies. They want to know I'm training people. I'm training a lot of people. And I'm providing my graduate students with a higher impact experience as well, which looks good. And it helps my grad students get more papers and get more scholarships. And if they get a scholarship, then they come off my payroll, which means I have more money to do other things with it. Uh, and it also improves their uh, highly qualified personnel outcomes for their applications. It's also been working really well for grad student recruitment and retention. It's amazing what you can do when you say to a grad student, look, you're not only, if you come work with me, you're not only going to be able to do the stuff you're going to do, you're going to have people working for you, with you, who are going to be able to accelerate your work. It's not going to be all based on what you're doing. And we can give you a unique training opportunity. So that's helpful. You can get some really, really good recruits. And it improves undergraduate recruitment. Uh, I like to think we get some of the most promising undergraduate students um, at the institution to come join our group. So next steps I need to do are assess, evaluate, and I'm not expanding it. Uh, 30 is about the maximum I can do. Uh, this was older. We're doing a collaboration with Texas A&M um, through my dean who moved from Texas A&M. And what we want to be doing is we want to be doing follow up three, five, 10 years with graduating students. So do we see a difference in students in this program versus students doing undergraduate research who aren't in a vertical mentoring program, so they did a fourth year honors project and maybe a little bit of other stuff versus students who didn't do research? Um, I keep planning on submitting ethics for this, but then other things come up, so I'm behind on this. I, I keep justifying that's okay because I really want to evaluate the system as kind of a, um, a system instead of like this ad hoc thing that I keep adjusting every six months as I figure out I'm not doing it right. I'm trying to export to other faculty here, being my university. Uh, that hasn't been very successful, but I'm always happy to talk about this with anybody else. Um, there's my contact. I'm always on Twitter, way too much, and my email. The, um, the reason I'm not expanding this anymore is because this generally leads to about eight honors theses every year, and I can handle eight honors theses. Uh, more than that, I'm actually not going to be able to do. And again, these students all know what they're doing. So this is really basically in their fourth year, we are training them how to write. That's it, because they're already knowing how to manage projects. They're already knowing how to solve problems. In the fourth year, we can really focus on putting down academic arguments. And, you know, sometimes we get them a little bit involved in grant writing. Sometimes we get them a little bit involved. We get them involved in publication writing, uh, but then the thesis as well. And so the idea is that we can really try and focus on the academic the thesis as a written document and what you should be doing into that and how you lay out a scientific argument. And I can do that with eight students. Uh, more than that is just too much. So um, I'm going to hopefully not take up another 45 minutes of your time to talk about the next portion of this. So now we can apply this as a tool for things. So again, this is reminder, all this thing, my group, biomedicine, design, make, test. So. If we're thinking about COVID-19, vaccines are here. Um, they are here in as the cavalry has come over the mountain to, to liberate us from the scourge. Uh, it hasn't worked great because a lot of people aren't getting vaccinated and now we're getting breakthrough cases. And the thing that everyone was expecting, which was a variant that was going to be possibly an escape variant, the Delta variant's not an escape variant. We're still protected, but 
escape variants now seem possible, which is terrifying. It's not done. Um, it would be really nice if the numbers were better around the world, but they're not. The uh, cases and deaths really haven't gone down. Uh, even in highly vaccinated countries like the UK, this has started falling off lately. Um, cases were going up even when vaccines were present. So we've still got problems. Vaccines are not the be all and end all of this. Unless you've been living under a rock in the last 18 months, you know this stuff. Um, SARS-CoV-2, the, the uh, virus that causes um, COVID-19, enters cells through attaching its spike protein to the ACE2 receptor on the surface of cells. Uh, this is a highly expressed protein, especially in rep respiratory tract. Uh, then it gets endocytosed and it opens up and it starts replicating and doing all the things that viruses do. If we start looking at this particular molecular interaction, again, this might be the most studied molecular interaction of the, you know, maybe in, in human history, really involves a single alpha helix from ACE2 binding to this kind of binding groove on the spike protein. And it's a helix. So, Let's target that. So one way we can try and do to prevent spike entering this is let's overwhelm it with so much ACE2 that it doesn't bind to your cells. That, it's actually, that's actually a really good idea. I made it sound kind of silly. But the problem is that it's low yields. It's an inefficient synthesis um, because it's low yields. And it's really, really, really expensive to make full length protein. Um, the other issue is, well, let's simplify it by just using the alpha helix that binds, because that's all you need. It's the only thing that binds. The rest of the protein is not really there to bind. It's to do things with the membrane and stuff, and signal and thingies, and we don't need that. We just need binding. Um, the problem is that, well, you need actually all these helices, because if you don't have all these helices, this helix kind of unfolds. And you get really excited when you have a nice small helix with a limited number of amino acids. But then when you see all the other helices, you just go, uh, damn it, okay, now we're back in the same problem with the molecules too big. We're back to low yields and efficiency. The binding domain on its own is a shitty ass binder. Um, sorry, you know what? There's a huge cultural difference between Canadians and Americans, um, and Americans actually and everyone else around the world, in that my understanding is in professional environments, uh, swearing is really, really just does not exist in the US. Um, in Canada, and I think my understanding is even more so in Australia, it's not really considered serious if you're not swearing a little bit. So I, I will try and keep my language more or less professional to um, attune to the cultural sensitivities of my American brethren and sisterin. So the binding on domain on its own is poor binding and therapeutic potential. What we see is that basically um, if you, what we have here is the alpha helix with different types of staples in here. I'm going to talk about staples in a second. And depending where we put them on that primary alpha helix, the thing unfolds. So this is a CD spectrum. You can predict the percent yeah, with complicated math and assuming there's no unnatural amino acids and nothing funky going on, you can predict the percent of it that is alpha helical. And um, at, this is the native peptide down here, uh, NIBSP-C. It is a 19% alpha helix. Well, if it's on alpha helix, it's not binding. And it doesn't like being an alpha helix very much. Depending where you put a staple, you can actually get that up pretty good. But the binding is still awful. To get anywhere near, you know, 80% inhibition, which would be nice, the best one is still up around, you know, seven and a half micromolar peptide. Uh, good luck turning that into a drug. You really need to be sub nano, like nanomolar. Love it to be picomolar. Uh, no reason you couldn't with like so, such a big surface binding area. But this is not going to be a drug. You're basically going to need to be taking horse pills of peptide to cure yourself of COVID-19. And um, that's really, really, really expensive. You know how expensive it is to make peptide. So all these sequences, even the ones that are really, really stable, uh, and a, a NIBSP4. So note that helicity doesn't necessarily match effectiveness. You need to be helical. You also need to bind really well. They're two different things. Helic being helical allows you to bind, but that doesn't tell you it's going to bind well. 
Uh, and binding well, hopefully you're mostly helical, but if you're more helical, it'll bind even better. So even NIPST C. So what's the solution? So I, you know, COVID-19 hit in February of 2020. We we're all aware this was going to be a big problem. Um, my guys came to me and said, John, maybe we should think about this. I went, no, no, we're not. There's a million smarter people in this world who are already virologists, who are already thinking about this, who already study these, the ACE2 receptor in its role in disease. Uh, we've got nothing to add. So we did very little on this for six months. We did, a, we did a little bit of work with an industrial partner, screening a bunch of molecules that they had, uh, computation screened them. Uh, for COVID-19 inhibition, and they're not awful, but it wasn't worth following up beyond our initial in vitro screens. They were, they were nanomolar activity, but high nanomolar, there's better drugs. But in December, Dan, uh, Dan here, who is dressed as an archer, this is all part of like a Dungeons and Dragons theme thing, um, said, you know what our solution is? I want to make this I think I've got an idea. I think I know what people are doing wrong. I think I know why that 7.5 micromolar binding and this stuff is really never going to work. So we're going to use staples, keeps things in alpha helix. Literally, we staple them. Um, my contribution is I always think about multivalency because everything's multivalent. Um, and the idea here is that your binding doesn't need to be perfect between any receptor and any protein. But if this dissociates, there's a whole lot of them really close by that they can bind again. So you're having a really high localized concentration. Uh, I really love unnatural amino acids. Uh, this is this is my jam. So we're going to improve binding by designing unnatural amino acids to take advantage of the interaction. Because again, spike is not evolutionary designed to bind ACE2. It happens to bind ACE2 because it jumped from some bat. But it's not a perfect match. We can design something that works better. And we want to use magnetic hyperthermia so that once these damn things are attached, we can then burn everything. So we can just burn the particles from the outside by applying magnetic fields. Not necessary, it's just cool. Um, gives us the extra little bonus. Later. Okay. Um, so what we need to do is we need to design a peptide. Um, I'm keeping my wife up, and so I have to get really quiet. I'm, I'm really sorry. Okay. I'm going to actually move my computer, so I apologize. I'll be right back. Um, there we go. So what we need to do is we need to design a peptide, we need to design a nanoparticle, we need to make the peptide, we need to make the nanoparticle, we need to make a linker, we need to connect them together, we need to get the biophysics data showing how these things connect, and then we need to go out and we need to get all the real bio data. Okay. Sorry. There we go. So when we design the peptide, we need to figure out what, where we wanted to put the staple, where we wanted to position the staple. Uh, we did this all using computational chemistry. We also need to figure out the best sequence we wanted to use. So we need to optimize the sequence. I'm not going to talk about that today. Um, we then also needed to then calculate the helical content for our different sequences because we wanted to maximize the helical content. Uh, and depending whether we, int uh, we don't change them, so we have nine different peptides with staples in different places. None is we did not make any substitutions. It's just the natural ACE2 sequence. Interface is we substituted at the interface with our preferred residues. All is we substituted all of them with the preferred residues. We like peptide number two and number seven, for example. We then did molecular dynamic simulations. So we do this by wiggling the peptide with the protein and seeing how well it sticks and how well it binds. We can actually pull out binding affinity data from this kind of work. So we can see how well they bind and kind of predict them in a relative way how well our different molecules will work. We then use something called MMGBSA, which is just a fancy algorithm which allows us to measure solvation, desolvation of everything and how things bind together and compensate for 
uh, a little bit for entropy and enthalpy in how all things bind. And we can pull out the binding affinities. And we can sort of see, hey, these ones look good, these ones don't look so good. Where we're going right now with the designing stuff is we're now adjusting our things to hit different COVID variants. So we're going to our peptide a little bit to affect the new spike proteins because they're slightly different. We, can, we have designed new peptides that we're making to target the variants. Then because we're doing multivalency, we need to attach our peptides to something. So we're using a nanoparticle because then we can have a whole bunch of peptides on one nanoparticle. So if one peptide dissociates from a receptor, another peptide is close by. To do this, um, it's computational and it actually seems simple. It is the most painful thing that was done in this entire project. So two postdocs led this work, uh, Nazanin and Mariam. And so what they had to do was use different pieces of software to design the different components. They then needed to do this really painful manual addition of all the different things, energetically minimize the system, uh, do the molecular dynamic simulations and all that. And what we want to make sure we're trying to measure here is what concentration of peptide do we want on our nanoparticle so the peptides sit as individual components and don't all kind of um, clump together. Because if they're all clumping together, they can't interact with the receptor because they're all clumped together. Um, so short, long story short, with six peptides on our nanoparticle, we have no interactions between the individual peptides, which is great. At seven, we start getting transient interactions. And at nine peptides, we start getting stabilized aggregates. So nine is too dense. Six might be where we might want it, but we want to maximize it without getting too dense where the things are no longer existing as single peptides. So what we're ending up looking at is targeting about one peptide per 40 to 50 nanometers squared of surface area, which is what my chemists need to know to go in and make this thing. So this first work has been done entirely by computational chemists in the group. We then need to make the residue. So this was led by another postdoc in the group, uh, Dr. John Hayward. And so it's pretty simple. We're making staples. These are pretty standard things. So you, you attach these two pieces, a different part of the peptide, and they lock the alpha helix into position. It can't unfold into this random coil because it can't unwrap. It's, it's stuck. Uh, so he needed to make a lot of this stuff. Um, he made it using chemistry. I'm a synthetic chemist. I always have a synthetic chemistry slide. Um, the important thing is I don't have a pointer on me right here because I have deactivated everything on my touchpad. But uh, the structure in the middle left there, uh, well, I guess actually the middle of the page is our primary thing, and that allows us to set the stereochemistry and get one enantiomer or the other enantiomer of our product. We can do this overall in 30% overall yield, um, we always like presiding precise ranges of reactions. So we're, we're reproducing this a few more times because we need to make more anyways. Then we need to make the peptide. And again, pulling in two graduate students, uh, Sana's whose thesis is all about cyclic peptides and Mana whose thesis is all about, uh, her thesis isn't about one particular thing. Uh, analytical chemistry, peptide chemistry, polymer chemistry. So we need to make nine different peptides minimum we're making the ACE2 protein. We've got that. Um, what we call the ACE2 long sequence, which is our helix, the ACE2 main helix plus some other stuff. The ACE2 alpha helix itself, just the core alpha helix. A truncated ACE2 helix, so just the part that binds to, spy, uh, to um, uh, spike. Then we have our drugs with our unnatural amino acids and our uh, precise sequence. So we have our precise match to that truncated helix using all natural residues with a better binding sequence. We have one where we add an azelicine, which we use to attach it to our nanoparticle. And we have one that has kind of a control because that staple has is a weird amino acid, so we control for that. Then we have one with the staples present, but we haven't closed them, so they're not making staples, so everything is there. And then we have them with the staples closed, like our actual drug candidate. So the first eight are all controls for the last one. So we can figure out where this doesn't work when it inevitably doesn't work. So where, where we lose activity or where we lose binding. 
Then we're currently making some with unnatural residues incorporated into the binding sites. Uh, these are weird ass amino acids that we just really like. Then we repeat the whole thing for two staple, other staples in two different places. So that's what we're currently doing. Our peptide synthesizer is pretty busy. Um, luckily, it's a robot, so that's great. Then we need to make the linker to connect the nanoparticle to the peptide. Uh, very, very simple chemistry. Maybe we could just really pull off another project, put on this project, and run it. Then we need to make the nanoparticles. Uh, again, up to this point, I've talked about computational chemistry. I've talked about peptide design. I've talked about peptide synthesis. I've talked about small molecule synthesis. Now we're doing inorganic chemistry synthesis of iron oxide nanoparticles. Um, uh, Ronnie Banerjee is, uh, did his PhD making iron oxide nanoparticles, so he's great. Emma Dennison is an undergraduate student in the group. So the two of them together made these things. Um, I have to show this TEM because it is the nicest TEM I have ever seen. None of mine look like this. Uh, really tight dispersion. These are 20 nanometer particles. They are perfect. Uh, we then swap out the thing we use to cap the nanoparticles with, with dopamine. And that's because it's got this amino group on there, which allows us to do chemistry. And the catechol binds really, really well. Mike, who's a synthetic organic chemist, carbohydrate chemist actually by training, then is functionalizing these things and doing all the analytical chemistry on these to figure out that we're making what we think we're making. And then Mike and Ronnie are also working together to couple the peptide onto this. So now we have, we can now couple the peptide onto our nanoparticles. There's lots of these things on each of these nanoparticles. Again, one for every 40 to 50 nanometers squared of surface area, which our computational chemist told us to target. So we have this setup ready to go. So all we have left is the finishing touches. Um, we got some brand new peptide HPLC columns, which uh, Agilent just released, which we're really excited to have because we're not losing all of our peptide every time we purify it, which is great. Um, and what we're doing is we want to attach about 25 peptides per nanoparticle. There are about 9,400 sites on each nanoparticle. So that tells us what kind of yield we're aiming for. And this is where I'm happy to have any insight. We're going to try and characterize these things. So we're going to have a nanoparticle with a linker attached to many, many different peptides, about 25 of them per nanoparticle. Uh, we're open to any way to do that. Right now, we're leaning heavily towards ICPMS as our main tool because we have a single sulfur atom in our peptide. So we can quantify the amount of sulfur relative to the amount of carbon and the amount of iron in the sample and sort of figure out the ratios. But uh, we're happy to have anyone who has other ideas other than what I've written there for how to quantify and analyze these things. Once we make them, we're testing them. So we have lots of spike in our lab um, and we're using something called surface plasmon resonance, which allows us to directly measure the binding efficiency and the binding kinetics of how well spike and our drug match. And we actually have enough for isothermal titration calorimetry for those of you who are biophysicists in there, which is really exciting because we never have enough for isothermal titration calorimetry and it's really much more accurate. Then we also have the plasmids in place, and we've transfected E. coli with them for preparing um, more spike and for preparing the variants of spike. So we're mutating the plasmids to make the variants, and we're incorporating those into uh, um, an active E. coli that is able to uh, produce lots and lots of plasmid. And this is a picture of our, bio our little mini benchtop bioreactor that we're using for that. And this is led by um, a graduate student, Simon and Mary, who is a bacteriologist. Uh, Bukola Aremu, who is a virologist and who also has a lot of experience in genomics. And Sanaz is the SPR expert in the group. Then, th then we're done. As far as my group is, we've done our design make test. We've gotten data back to design. I'm not handling SARS-CoV-2. It terrifies me. Uh, so we're going to send it out for cell and animal work with a wonderful colleague at Laval University who does have a BSL level 3 lab who is handling SARS-CoV-2 on a regular basis. Uh, good luck to him. And we work through him because I have an undergraduate student who joined a company, Devonian, and suddenly now we're talking with them and now we're making a partnership and he's on a scientific board and I'm on a scientific board. So we met each other 
And then when we were chatting, he's like, I'm handling SARS-CoV-2. And I went, I'm making drugs for SARS-CoV-2. And suddenly everything's happening. So having that network actually came back and created the collaboration, which allows us to make this kind of work happen. So in summary, um, I told my people not to do this. They went ahead and looked at it anyways. Uh, and I listened. So trust your team, trust your people to do things. Um, this is only possible because we're multidisciplinary, because we're able to have inorganic chemists, synthetic chemists, computational chemists, biophysicists, biologists, virologists in the group. And we were able to pivot really, really quickly and have everybody do everything in parallel and work really well together. Then, um, you have to be comfortable with chaos, absolute utter chaos, and just embrace it, not try and control it. So I am letting these people talk on a peer-to-peer -peer level to figure things out. We're not trying, not trying to direct this from above. And you also have to be able and willing to pivot. So didn't talk about this at all. It's gone on long enough. I'm not going to. Um, but I don't really believe in the single project, single student thesis model. We try and give all of our graduate students experience and expertise and ability to see lots and lots of different problems. And what that means is we can quickly pivot projects because my students are really open and they're used to doing this anyways. Um, part of this wing is actually for a conference presentation. So I left this slide in. I am currently hiring uh, synthetic PDF and grad students if anyone's looking for something or knows people looking for stuff. Um, preferably Canadians because of immigration issues and COVID-19, but we're open to the best person we can get. Okay, well, thank you very much. And I'm sorry for keeping everyone up really, really late. Um, and I think I'm open for any questions anyone might have. All right, fantastic. That was a, a very entertaining talk. And if, uh, if foul language is unprofessional, then I guess I'm fucking unprofessional. <laughs> there we go. Okay. You know, we, we, at, at least at least in my lab, there's language shows up a lot, usually because something's not working properly. Uh, all right. So we have a number of questions. Um, I know you're, you're, as you said, you're up past your bedtime, so we will try and not have it take too long. Well, I, I kept everyone else up past their bedtime, so oh, okay. I, will, I will sit here and finish this off. I just have to go sit in a different room now because I didn't want to... My, my wife's bedroom is right, or our bedroom is right above my office, and so oh, I was waiting okay. her up. It made me very unpopular. Yeah, understandable. No worries. <laughs> uh, all right, so we'll just get started. So uh, how, how do you talk about you have somewhere in the ballpark for like 65 projects? Um, yeah. How do you keep organization over all of those projects? So not necessarily like you know, telling everybody what to do on everything, but sort of how, how are you keeping track of everything that's going on? So I, um, I read something that really crystallized something for me a few years ago, and I wish I could find it again. And it was written by a new PI. Mm -hmm. And he was saying that when he was a student and a postdoc, he always thought that his supervisors were these absolutely incredible scientists who were amazing at absolutely everything. Mm -hmm. And then when he became a PI, he realized well, that's not true. But they were all really they were all really good at one or two things, and they were competent at everything else. Yeah. And what they did was they leaned on their super strengths, so they kind of had superpowers, and then they were normal on everything else. But they structured things to try and lean on their strengths. Um, I'm my super strength is keeping track of stuff like this. I'm just okay. It. I, I wish I could say there's some there's some way of doing it. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's like, I structure it. So we have, we have a giant group meeting every, uh, every week. It's, you know, it's two hours long. Mm -hmm. Um, but at one point we used to discuss problems in there and, and where everyone was at, but it, that's not possible anymore with the group sure. being about 70 people. So now that's mainly formal presentation. So what we've done is we have, I spend my Thursdays and Friday mornings doing subgroup meetings. So every two weeks. Mm -hmm. Uh, I meet with teams of between five and 10 people okay. uh, who are working on related projects and who might have insight on related projects. Mm -hmm. And so those, so for an hour, every two weeks, we sit down and we go through with everybody on their projects. And so there, I have many of those people are in three or four of those different meetings for different things that they're working on. Sure. But everybody in the group is in at least one of them. Okay. Um, and so that, that sort of allows check-ins every two weeks. I, I 
Yeah, I keep good notes. Um, okay. And I have really awesome people. So I have sort of, you know, lieutenants in the lab who okay. keep track on everything. And if they see something going off the like off the rails, the and the graduate student or the undergrad, whoever's in charge or postdoc or undergrad who isn't reporting it to me, mm -hmm. they'll come up to me and say, "Hey, John, uh, I think this needs some attention. Uh, nobody's talking to you about it." Okay. So, yeah, again, it comes down to delegating responsibility. Nice. Okay. Yeah. Um, you, you touched on this a little bit, but I, I'll go ahead and ask the question just to kind of you know, in case there's maybe some additional. Uh, something you want to say on it. Um, how, so you, how do you handle the funding of the undergraduates? You said you have about 30 of them or so. Yeah. Um, do, uh, yeah. It sounds like you have some combination of like people that people that are just doing the research for experience. Some of them are doing it for credit. Some of them are being paid as well. Is that, is that fair? Yeah, that's fair. And so one of the, the one of the, I think it's an ethical dilemma and I think it's a fair one mm -hmm. is how is it fair? that you have two students sitting next to each other, working next to each other, mm -hmm. one of whom's being paid and one of whom's not. Yeah. And I don't have an answer for you for that. I don't have an answer for anyone. What I would say is that we're very open about that. Everybody knows who is doing what and for what. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm always, I run basically a completely transparent lab. My group knows our finances. They know what grants we're applying for. They know how much money we've got. They know how much different people are being paid. They know why. And I basically say, like I've, I've often said to students, you know, I can't pay you. Um, I think I can, especially when I'm talking to somebody, interviewing them for the first time, I say, these other labs have many fewer students. They, they've got openings. They are actually paying for somebody. You want, might want to consider doing that for the pay. For some students, the, the money makes a difference. Sure. And happily, they go there, and I, I feel I've, I've done my duty. For other ones, it's like, they come from more privileged backgrounds, mm -hmm. the money is not important. Okay. So what we try and do is, again, not worrying as much about equality, but more about equity. Mm -hmm. So if I have a student, and I have had a couple of these who've gone, I really want to do this, John, I really want to get involved, but you know, I'm a refugee, I've got to work to support mm -hmm. my family, I have to do this 20 hour a week job. I'm like, okay, you know what, I'll, I'll find the money for you so that you can do this. Because yeah. for you, this is, the difference between being able to do it and not being able to do it. Yeah. Um, and again, but a lot of our students, because we have this program, we call it Outstanding Scholars here. Mm -hmm. It pays the students about 4,500 bucks a year, which is, you know, in Canada, that's three quarters of your tuition Okay. to do research. Mm -hmm. And it's a merit-based thing that we have, and they enter it in second year. So what we often have as well, the students starting with us in first year, they have this research experience. They know a lot about what they're trying to do with research. Mm -hmm. So when they're applying for this in second year, we've had a really good success rate of having them win these. Okay. Um, so that now, then we're fighting with, then we're, you know, then the risk is, am I cannibalizing from other members of my, my uh, institution? Sure. And yeah, I, I don't know what the solution to any of this is. Um, yeah, I, th I think it's one of the hardest parts. <laughs> It is. You could always use more funding. Everyone could do with more funding. Everyone could do with more support. And what we're, what I'm trying to do is, as, as we're able to secure other sources of funding and other funding lines, I'm trying to uh, pull back from some of the institutional things to free those up for other groups. Sure. Um, because I'm able to do that. So it, it, it's kind of this, I don't know. Uh, I don't have a perfect answer for that. And I, that's something that bothers me too. So that's a really good question. Yeah, well, like you said, it, it's, a, it's a difficult one because there, there are lots of different angles on it. And, and it's, it's, not a, it's not a simple answer. Uh, yeah, I think we just need to think about equity. Yeah, and I agree. How can we make this available to the people who it needs to be available for? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Um, so you, you talked, you touched on it a little bit, uh, you, or at least you mentioned it as a concern. Um, how do you get the space required to handle all these different projects? Sorry. How, how do you get the, the space required or how do you, how do you deal with, um, I, mean, I, I guess right yeah. now, maybe it's a little bit different cause you kind of have people coming in and out. So you don't have everybody in at once because of COVID, but, uh, how, yeah, how do you balance all these projects in terms of people being able to actually do what they need to do? Yeah. So when I say this, people go, well, how, how do you get 30 undergrads in that space? Yeah. Um, so 
I'm going to throw that back. We're doing, each of my undergrads is doing about 10 hours a week. Mm -hmm. um, my lab is open from, you know, I've got, I've got, a, I've got one crazy postdoc who really likes being in there at 5.30 a.m., but let, most reasonable human beings are in there from about 7 a.m., yeah. 8 a.m. at the earliest. Mm -hmm. Uh, most of my grad, my, my core hours, my group are 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Okay. Um, and a lot of my grad students roll in around 10 a.m. Yeah. But so we're open from about 8 a.m. We got people around enough people till I'd say about 8, 9 p.m. Mm -hmm. most days. So that's 12 hours, five days a week. Uh, I got a few grad students and postdocs who love working on a weekend. It's not group policy, but um, I'm not going to say no if somebody wants to do it. Oh, yeah, sure. So we often, and our labs are all interconnected as a suite. So we almost always have somebody in there between, you know, 8 a.m. and, you know, again, 8 p.m. on the weekends. Okay. So that we're looking at 12 times 7. Mm -hmm. uh, you, I, I, I suck at math. So it's 140, 70, 82, 90, 94 hours um, mm -hmm. a week. That seems wrong. Probably should 84. be 96. Anyways. Yeah. And so you've got 30 students coming in for 10 hours a week spread over that 96 hours. And a lot of the undergrads really like coming in on the weekend okay. because it's easier for them because they don't need to then try and navigate that around their classwork or courses. And a lot of them are living in residence or they're doing something else and they're, they're not living in a great situation maybe at home. Mm -hmm. So the lab is kind of a happy place and a relaxing place to come in. Okay. So we've never actually had a space crunch. Uh, it's never really that busy. Hmm. If, if, yeah, it's it's just actually not come up as an issue. Interesting. Okay. Uh, let's see. Um, so this one kind of on the undergrads as well. Um, how do you how do you make sure that undergrads are actually spending the fifteen hours a week in the lab? Um, now this is actually a, a, a professor at a, at Western Oregon University. She's a doctor, Doctor Ho. Um, hey. So yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, so she she says that she. Most of her students can spend, the, the most time that they can spend in the lab is about 10 hours a week because they have all their other responsibilities, work, family care, classes, and so on. Um, so do you, okay, do, do you pay undergrads so they don't have to work other than research and for the 15 hours a week, is that kind of like an on average thing? So you, you kind of talked about like, you know, midterms and finals, there's not as much of an expectation that they be in the lab then, um, but do, then do they kind of, is it, is it like 10 to 15 hours a week on average or... Uh, how do you how do you work that time or that time commitment that you're asking for? So I think what I always I always tell them ten to fifteen hours. In my mind, I'm penciling in ten. Okay. In my mind, I'm actually penciling in eight. Yeah. Um, I just won't tell them that. Sure. So if if they're paid, they're normally they're normally paying actually through these uh, time card things. I don't worry so much about that. Again, what I'm worrying about is. The reason I'm asking that isn't because I'm trying to enforce a specific number of hours. Mm -hmm. The reason I'm asking that is because I'm trying to ensure that I'm getting a sufficient level of engagement, that the student is feeling like they're making progress. Okay. Because what I've found is that if, in general, there, there are some exceptions, of course, there's always exceptions, mm -hmm. but in general, if we have a student who's making progress in the research thing, we I've actually had to have conversations with a few of them to say, okay, um, I think you're coming in too much. <laughs> like sometimes they're coming in around 20, 25, 30 hours a week. I'm yeah. getting students, undergraduate students who are doing full-time jobs on top of their training and yeah. schooling. Some of them are working part-time jobs, but now they're coming in like 25, 30 hours a week in the lab. Wow. And I'm like, you're looking really tired and kind of worn out. Maybe you want to back off a little bit on this. So what we're trying to make sure we're doing is that we're, we're they're putting in enough hours to generate that virtuous cycle. Okay. Uh, and it is an average. So, you know, uh, it's more, it's not actually an average is a wrong way to put it. It's the minimum on a week when they don't have a lot of other issues going on. Okay. But if they have midterms or finals, we might not see them that week at all. Mm -hmm. And we're not asking them to make up that time. Yeah. Um, it's just that, that those hours disappear. And that's fine if that, if you know, it's one or two weeks at a time and then they're back in. Mm -hmm. It's just we need to make sure that they're doing a regular commitment to benefit from this. Okay. Do you, I guess along those same lines, do you, do you work with them? Like, you know, like when I've had undergrads, you know, I kind of, I'm like, you know, show me your schedule and let's kind of figure out when some good times for you might be to come in. You know, it's not, it's not always, it's not saying, okay, you must be here from, you know, X to Y on these days. 
but you know, personally, I've always tried to encourage them to try and find a little bit longer blocks because you know it's yeah. hard. It's hard to come in for like one hour between classes and do a whole lot unless it's unless that happens to be what the you know the experiment needs or whatever. You know, if you're just flipping a switch and going, that's one thing. But you know, I always tell them that there's some startup time. Every mm-hmm. time you come into the lab, you know, you always have to get things out, set stuff up, whatever it is. And so, if, you know, you you, you kind of want to set out longer blocks if you can, basically. Yeah, and I, I, that's something that we, we do, I do mention to them, but I actually leave that, that level of detail up to their immediate graduate mentor. Okay. So norm, most, most of our, no, all of our initial undergrads are normally assigned a graduate or a postdoctoral mentor as their primary point of contact, mm-hmm. and they'll work with that person and their colleagues who are in that same lab space. And for that first, I didn't go in, it was already long enough, mm-hmm. but for the first year that they're in a lab, they're really... Again, lots of exceptions to this rule, mm-hmm. but they're really learning technical skills. And the precise project that they're on doesn't really matter. Mm-hmm. If they're in one area, the technical skills needed for one project versus another project versus something else are all pretty similar. Mm-hmm. And so they're often um, coordinating with a, a lead person who might go over that schedule thing. I actually leave, I, I try and leave that, I, I give some outlines to my graduate students and postdocs and saying these are some things you might want to consider when you have an undergraduate trainee mm-hmm. but i'm not going to tell them how to train people like if if we had any issues where it got abusive or there, sure. there was an issue then then we step in it hasn't happened um but what i have here is every one of them chooses to train differently mm-hmm. and because and i could impose my way of training sure. that wouldn't work because when you impose something unnatural on somebody, it doesn't work. What it means is we have enough flexible environments in the group so that if a particular undergraduate doesn't mesh with the graduate student that we first assigned them to, mm-hmm. at that six-week check-in mark, we're often moving some people around. Okay. Because uh, I'm like, okay, this isn't working for you. You're, you need this style. This person over here is much more that style. Mm-hmm. Uh, either more micromanagement, less micromanagement, more direction, less direction, whatever the case may be. Okay. That's good. Yeah, it just... Don't I try not to make the rules too strict because it needs to be flexible because everybody's different. I, I agree with that. I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, I'll, I'll skip to a question that kind of goes along the same lines of what we've been talking about. Um, does your school provide assistantships or uh, work study programs? Yeah, they do. So we we have we have some students in on work study. I always feel a little guilty doing it because um, I always think. Like our work study is not so much used by the research labs; it's more used by the um, the school infrastructure side. Mm-hmm. But I, I don't end up feeling guilty enough not to submit the jobs. Yeah. Um, so yeah, again, we, we we can use those resources to bring people in. Okay. Yeah. Um, that, that's my funding. Yeah. Do you do you get undergrads uh, who need lots of handholding, um, like? Uh, the example given is basically, you know, every time they come to the lab, they need, they, they expect you or their mentor to tell them what to do. Um, and how do you gradually get them to become more independent, which, uh, you know, sort of as your goal? Yeah, that that's, that's a really good question. So we're bringing students in in first year and we interview them. I interview all, all the prospective students. And normally what we do is we'll do panel interviews uh, with, I do it with a so it's not my fault. I do it with a bunch of my grad students to also be in on the interview, and then we have a vote. Okay. We rank the candidates. Um, so we might interview, I think last year, I think, no, two years ago, uh, pre-COVID, I think we interviewed 15 people for eight positions. Mm-hmm. Um, there's really nothing to base that decision on except, you know, perceived passion, enthusiasm, interest. Mm-hmm. Like, GPA does not translate perfectly to productivity or usefulness or interest in the lab. Um, I think the one thing it does tell you, a high GPA tells you that the student is, has some study skills Mm -hmm. and is very proficient at writing multiple choice exams. But that doesn't tell you that much about how useful they're going to be in a lab. So I don't want to rely too heavily on GPA. If a student's really struggling, we tend not to accept them because adding an extra you know, they're already carrying a heavy burden, so now we're going to add more to their burden. Right. And that might that might hurt their, their productivity um, in their coursework, and that's not going to do them any favors. But, you know, we don't really differentiate between a student who's 
you know, rocking a 65% average versus one who's carrying a 98% average. Okay. Like there, there's not necessarily a lot of functional difference there. Yeah. So you have no idea what you're getting in the way of a student. I'm, I, I am getting to the question. Mm -hmm. So you, that the student walks in day one and they might have a 98% average. And sometimes those are the most um, neurotic students mm -hmm. who feel the least comfortable with, you know, getting freedom. But at first we're, they're all attached at the hip to somebody, sure. which has been really hard during COVID because we can't do it. Yeah. So we haven't been able to train people. Um, and then we, you know, we slowly let the rope out and let the student build up responsibility, but it doesn't happen for everybody. Uh, a couple of years ago, I had a fourth year student graduate who, you know, they're going into their fourth year, normally they do an honors thesis. I ask all my students if they want to do an honors thesis. I actually probably have fewer students choosing to do an honors thesis than almost anyone else because they've seen other people do the honors thesis and they're like, uh, John, I just really want to do the research. I don't really want to deal with all that garbage. Um, can I not do the thesis and yeah. just do the work? Yeah. And like, if the point of the honors thesis is to get research experience, and these guys have already published papers, then it's like you, you don't have anything more to prove. Right. Yeah. Um, it's not going to hurt your grad school application to do a an honors degree by course credit if you have some papers. So this student was one of those, and she went, you know what? I don't really want to do that. And I said, okay, well, what do you want to do? Because you really haven't taken on like a leading role at any point. Normally in the third year, you do. And she's like, well, I really like cleaning glassware. And I went, okay, sure. So for about 10 hours a week in our fourth year, she would come in and clean glassware. Okay. That's not something we even make our first year students do. Like our grad students clean their own glassware. Sure. The student wanted to participate in the lab by cleaning glassware. That was the level of responsibility that she wanted. And that's what she wanted to do. Okay. Fine. Um, we have other students who never really proceed much beyond the, I basically need a list of, of things to do. Mm -hmm. um, it's rare. Uh, very, very few do that. Most, most students want to proceed beyond that. Sure. And so it's not normally that hard to do, but that, that has happened, in which case normally what happens then is there We've ha we had a student like that as well who wanted to do experimental work, but really wasn't comfortable leading anything. They were going into their fourth year. They chose not to do an honors thesis. Uh, and they were getting direction from a second year undergraduate student who was leading a project. Right. So, because that person was ready to be leading a project, like a superstar. And um, yeah. so, again, not getting too caught up at the hierarchy on what thing people are doing. And everyone in the group is seeing this. Um, like they're seeing that graduate students are directing postdocs and undergrads are directing graduate students. So on some specific projects, so everyone kind of feels comfortable with filling into a role. It's like, okay, on this project, I'm secondary. I'm not primary. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I like that. So, so you deal with it on a case by case basis, I guess is my answer. Hey, I guess and, and along the same, do you, do you kind of set that out like when, when you're hiring graduate students and postdocs, do you, do you basically tell them, Hey, they're, you know, you, you may be working in a secondary role with an undergraduate, you know, yep. asking you to do stuff for them. Yep. Good. And I get some really weird reactions to that. I'm um, sure. <laughs> and most of the time, if I'm, if I'm interviewing them, I've had a few email exchanges and I've sort of convinced myself that this person isn't just saying, you know, dear professor number 5002, who I am emailing, I want to work in your lab. You know, we've gone in and they're like, okay, this is why I want to be with, working with you. And normally they're saying, well, I like this work, I like that work. And I say, well, you know, that work arose because of this situation. Um, so, you know, the, you're, you're signing up for the whole package. You're, you're going to have a team of people working with you, like a bunch of undergrads who you are going to be directing. But on some of those projects, the undergrad is going to be more knowledgeable and more closer to it than you, and you're going to be supporting them. They're going to tell you, hey, I need this, I, I need this done, I need to go, can you do this thing for me? Or... Um, can you help me solve this particular problem where I'm driving a project and the grad students in support? And, you know, when you tell the grad student, you're going to get the paper. Um, if the undergrad leaves and doesn't write it up and you finish it up, I guess you're first. So mm -hmm. it's not normally a hard sell. And once, once they see the dynamic work, mm -hmm. it's pretty smooth. It is unusual that an undergrad is directing a grad student or a postdoc directly, but it has happened. And so, yeah. Um, we do make it clear that, that happens, but those are also normally the undergrads who they're, they're 
everyone recognizes that these these people are pretty special mm -hmm. and so there's not egos need to be checked at doors yeah including mine yeah i think that's a that's a great way to do it yeah um do you do you think that a lab course that has students doing actual research um so for instance different conditions for like a reaction um and you know, sort of collecting data in parallel is that something that you think could be utilized to encourage undergraduate research so maybe provide some exposure and then get students interested in the prospect of of doing research yeah i I think so, but I think we have to be a little cautious with that. Cause that, so I thought about putting that into our, um, I, I get to, we're in a small university. So there's two of us that are kind of like the primary organic chemists mm -hmm. and we get to, you know, if, if we both agree on something and he's very senior to me, but he's a, he's a wonderful senior colleague. Okay. Um, cause he's, he's open to all this stuff and if we if we agree on something we can design that so we've thought about putting that into our second year undergraduate it's our first introductory organic chemistry lab mm -hmm. is trying to do that designing experiment where we would have you know all 400 students going through this generating data that they could then kind of collectively write a paper on mm -hmm. um it's still in kind of the the thinking modes what i think we need to be careful about that though is everyone doing something in parallel to generate data is that research Mm -hmm. because research questions come from the student actually thinking about how do I go about doing this kind of, and solving this problem. Mm -hmm. And if everyone is doing something in parallel that the problem has been already been identified, the solution has been identified, here's the things that you are going to do, now go into the lab and do the technique. Mm -hmm. um, and it, I think it would be very difficult to write a paper with 450 co-authors all kind of sharing things. Yeah. Uh, it's difficult enough to write it sometimes with three co-authors. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not sure how we can make sure that that experience, like that re the research part of the research experience mm -hmm. uh, translated, because we could definitely do the, you are doing technically new things that nobody has done before. Yeah. But how do you get that, the intellectual component of that in that kind of massively parallel system? And I'm I'm not convinced that the experience we would get through that massively parallel thing is necessarily all that much better than the experience that we get through the traditional teaching lab. Okay. Um, so, it, and it's, so I don't have a solution to that. I think, mm -hmm. I think it could be better. Um, I, I just haven't been convinced yet. Okay. All right. That's fair. But I, I'm, I, I don't know what I'm doing again. So I, <laughs> there's people who are probably a lot smarter than me who are figuring out ways to make that work very well. I and so I'm always so. excited to see that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what kind of assessments do you have your students complete? Assessments. Yeah. Uh, I think this, this may be from when you were talking about um, like following up with your students and things like that. Oh, so um, this is still theoretical. So we're going to – we – there aren't, I haven't put through the ethics yet. Okay. Um, there aren't a lot of validated, my, my wife is a clinical psychologist, which is really, really helpful because she's a social scientist. Nice. And she knows that when natural scientists do social science, we, we screw it up oh, yeah. um, really badly because we don't know what we're doing. Yeah. And so I, I've looked for validated outcome surveys, like people like people have done these and used these to kind of things. They don't really exist for this stuff. Okay. So we'd have to develop our own, and I am scared of that. So I am probably Fair. going to find a collaborator at some point. Uh, but will we be the outcomes that we're looking at there? I think are, I, you know, we could look at some really crude outcomes, like what is your salary ten years after, mm -hmm. right? Um, job satisfaction. But I'm not really sure, how do we judge if an education is successful? Right. Like, what this or any education, like, not just this system, but just any education. Mm -hmm. And I think if there's a really good way to do it, um, some leading institutions, you know, actually know that some second-tier institutions will be whacking leading institutions over the head with that data right now oh, yeah. to do student recruitment. And so I don't, I don't know if we have a great tool. Um, okay. So I don't, I don't know yet. I, I need to put a lot more thought into that. Okay. I'll, it's I'll, what I want to do, but yeah. I haven't done it yet. All right. I'll be interested in seeing, you know, when, when it does uh, sort of come to fruition. I'll be, I'll be watching for that. <laughs> it might be very old and gray. <laughs> you know, that possibly. That's all right. 
Uh, all right, so we've got some questions on the uh, more science-oriented side of the talk. Um, what do you think of the, oh, this is from uh, Dr. Kothapali from the University of uh, Oklahoma. Um, she wanted to know what you think of the AlphaFold system that was recently published for determining the structural relevance. Ah, uh, yeah, so we, we've been really excited. So what, one of the major challenges we face in you know, doing all of our science is, as I said, I'm really interested in proteins that are understudied. And the problem with understudied proteins is you often don't have a lot of good crystal structures. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes you don't have any good crystal structures. And so what you're relying on then is you're relying on something called homology modeling, mm -hmm. where you try and find proteins that are similar in sequence, uh, and you try and do the magic of computational chemistry mm -hmm. to predict the structure of your protein based on similar sequences. AlphaFold2 is the best algorithm that has ever been developed when, for predicting the structure of proteins when they are really similar. Okay. The, the Google team, the, so there's a few things with how that algorithm works. It is not a biochemical algorithm. It doesn't take into account any kind of molecular interaction or force fields of electron clouds. It's a pure machine learning algorithm. It's been fed a lot of really good data. Mm -hmm. It recognizes things and it's really good at finding patterns. It, it, it's, it's what Google does, right? Yeah. Finding patterns. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it has shown absolutely ridiculous accuracy for when proteins show very high homology, very, very similar to one that's already known. Mm -hmm. The, there's two remaining challenges there. One is, what if your protein isn't a lot like that? And second one is, what that gives you is it gives you the minimum energy structure of the protein. Now, that's also often what you approach with a crystal structure. But the minimum energy structure, first of all, um, we have to think about what happens when you crystallize a protein. You're not getting the native structure of the protein when it's doing its thing. You're getting the structure of the protein when it packs really nicely in a crystal. Yeah. And that can differ massively or it can be very, very close. You're also not getting, proteins are dynamic. The whole, like if, if, if things were static, um, we wouldn't really need proteins. Like they wouldn't need that flexibility, but proteins do their thing by moving constantly. And crystal structures don't trap that. And neither does like the minimum structure from alpha fold. So we're really excited to try it out. Mm -hmm. um, it's better than a lot that's out there, but what we were actually much more excited about was a paper that came out the same week in science as well from the team at Rosetta, which is this molecular modeling software developed by the Baker Group. I think they're at UCSF. Mm -hmm. um, and Rosetta is our, our weapon of choice for this. It is an all atomic kind of system. They have something they call Rosetta Fold because everyone's calling things Fold these yeah. days. <laughs> Um, it, it shares some of the same tools as AlphaFold, some of the same ideas, but it is looking more at atomic interactions. And so it can, it, it's slightly much better for low homology systems. It shows much better accuracy. And what it's also able to deal with is when we have two proteins bound together and how each of them are affecting each other in their binding. And AlphaFold 2 has nothing to say about that. It doesn't work when you have more than one protein whereas this Rosetta Fold thing is. So we were excited about AlphaFold, but we were more excited about was because AlphaFold was published, the Rosetta Fold people published very quickly as well to not get completely scooped by AlphaFold. And Makes that's sense. what we're super excited about. Nice, that's awesome. Yeah, uh, and giving giving a, giving a shout out to some really amazing group and uh, work from academic uh, teams. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so Rama actually also uh, suggested uh, someone named Aaron Dolan. E-R-I-N-D-O-L-A-N, uh, uh, apparently does student development surveys for undergraduate research. Oh, that's awesome. So that might be, um, might be useful. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, let's see. Um, so she also asked, uh, have you tried to use click chemistry cross-link amino acids to lock the unfolding of the helix? I hope those words made more sense to you than they do to me. Yeah, so... <laughs> I'm, not a, um, I'm not a biochemist. <laughs> no, they, no, and it's absolutely so. That, that's what, talking about this. Can we can we use other chemistries to lock this? Absolutely, we can use other chemistries. Um, 
this Grubbs Metathesis approach has been really well validated. The nice thing about it is that what we're going to be including is we're going to have, for somebody asking that question, we're going to be including multiple staples on this thing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, our alpha helix is a little bit longer than this, but still, they're pretty close together. The risk with, um, the nice thing about Grubbs Metathesis is it uses reversible chemistry. Mm -hmm. And so it's going to find the minimum structure, and we've designed it to find that. So if by accident this guy couples to the wrong one, like one over here, which we don't want it to because that one's supposed to couple to one over here, mm -hmm. it will break apart and then we find the one that's minimal. So it will adopt this over time. Okay. So even if it does trap the wrong thing, it'll go back. If we use click chemistry, it's irreversible. Um, still, I comment I would get as well, we just put the pairs in the right place. I, I agree. This has been worked out chemically for these kinds of things. Mm -hmm. um, this is a very, very small component here. Uh, the triazole shouldn't be problematic, but watch it be problematic. <laughs> There's enough wheels being reinvented here that we, we decided let's not reinvent another one. Fair enough. Um, risk management, I guess. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. So a couple of things there to think about over why, why we're making this decision, but part of it is uh, smarter people than us have identified this as a really good technique to lock the uh, the helix in, and I like doing click chemistry. We do a lot of we're doing click chemistry on the other parts of our thing, uh, and we're actually using it to attack. Like we're using copper azide alkyne cycloaddition chemistry to link our peptide to the um, the nanoparticle. Like uh, mm -hmm. I skipped. I, I was moving pretty quickly there, but here that's exactly what we're doing. We're we're sticking a zitolysine on the end of ours. And so okay. also using that staple there keeps it orthogonal. So we can do one chemistry and not the other chemistry by accident. We just make sure we're doing what we think we're doing. Oh, that's, that's really handy. Um, okay. And I, our last question, unless somebody else sneaks one in real quick, um, have you tried using, or have you tried doing thermal melts instead of ITC? Yes. Um, we actually do have the setup for that. We've actually started doing thermal melts for some of the stuff. I love the, I love the detail that ITC gives us, but when we don't have enough material, that is exactly what we're doing on a bunch of other projects is, um, is thermal melts between drugs and proteins using the natural abundance of the protein in the target cell. Uh, and it's a, it's a really great technique. I completely agree. And it's awesome, especially what we're really excited about with it is it's awesome when we're working with one pharmaceutical company that's made a drug and they don't quite know what its target is. And so we're using thermal melts on whole cells to try and identify which proteins it's binding to, which ones to stabilize it. So yeah, it's, it, that is a good technique uh, and we have the equipment for that, but I really like ITC. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> uh, all right, so I think so. I think that's the, that was the last question that we had. Um, so we'll go ahead and start wrapping up. Uh, if anybody has any last second ones, certainly feel free to get them in. Uh, but in the meantime, I will thank Dr. Trent um, for uh, a, an entertaining and informative talk. Uh, I, I found it like it was really it's really great to listen to, uh, and I actually learned a lot, especially about the the how to how to handle the the undergraduate researchers. I think that you know personally uh, as a researcher with uh, only three undergraduates right now, that's going to be very useful in terms of thinking about how to develop them as researchers. Um, and, and in, in, you know, any, any future ones as well. Uh, it's not as scary as it can be. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, we do have one more question. Uh, do you have access to a circular dichroism machine? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah, so we can measure. Yeah, that's a good idea. We can. I hadn't thought about measuring the CD stability of the peptides once they're on the particle. Um, I think it could be. It sh it shouldn't be too complicated by anything else on there. There are there are a few other chromophores on there which do throw off the CD spectra. Okay. Um, but it should be okay. Is 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 or does a particular peptide have like a, a characteristic? response to it is that is that what that's for yeah well what it actually tells I, I showed some cd spectra back here I'm just um i I'm, I'm really sorry everybody that this is i'm i'm i'm, I'm keeping you up also late i'm no, this, so, this I feel is really awful it's, it's really entertaining um where did i have my cd spectra there we go 
So this up here is a circular dichroism spectra. What it's measuring is uh, an angle difference as a function of the wavelength that scans over wavelengths. And what you get is these, um, these curves. And each different secondary structure, an alpha helix, a beta sheet, a polyproline type 2 turn, a random coil, have different spectra. Mm -hmm. And so what we can do is that we can sort of add, we can sort of deconvolute this and try and add up different um, linear combinations of those spectra to try and match the spectrum. And you can sort of predict what percentage of it is in different forms. The problem is that if you have anything that isn't really amide backbone, mm -hmm. like this is, this is taking in the amide backbone, um, you have to be very careful with interpreting them because it can throw it off. So okay. tryptophans really start throwing this thing off. And um, us having other carbonyls in our system is going to affect it. So we'd have to be very careful about over-interpreting it. Mm -hmm. But the 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 uh, questioner is right in that we could use it in a relative form to see if our things are still staying properly folded, especially properly folded as a function of time and during coupling. So I, I think it could we could always create sort of physical mixtures and then, you know, actually create the, uh, combine it with the actual molecule itself. That's a, mm -hmm. that's a really good idea. I hadn't thought about that. Thank you very much. Yeah, awesome. That'll be very useful. Yeah. Great. Uh, I'm actually going to add that to my slide right now before I forget. Yeah, absolutely. Please feel free. Like I said, this is one, this is one of my favorite parts about the Q and A is we, you know, everybody comes in from oh. a different background all of a sudden, <laughs> some good ideas get passed around. Yeah. Uh, well, fantastic. Um, so I, I think that's all the questions. Um, so I will say thank you again um, to Dr. Trant. Uh, if I could get you to hang on for just one second, we'll talk just very briefly, uh, and then, that, then I won't keep you up any longer than that. Um, I will say thank you to everybody else for coming out tonight. Uh, like I said it was a th thoroughly entertaining and interesting talk, um, and uh, yeah, really appreciate it. And we will be back next week. Um, with Dr. Chris Brewer from the University of Florida. Uh, I'm sure it will be another interesting talk. Uh, and I hope everybody has a great weekend. Stay safe. Get, I, I'm assuming that everybody that's here is probably vaccinated at this point. If you're somehow not, please do. Uh, keep wearing a mask and make better decisions than the governors of red states, I guess. Uh, <laughs> in the meantime, uh, have a great weekend, and uh, we'll hopefully see you next week. Thanks for coming out, everybody.